Tonight, police are hailing a program to curb gun violence as a success. Our specialized approach allowed officers to make hundreds of arrests. Almost 500 arrests and over 1,000 charges laid. Still, the city has seen a record number of shootings this year. Plus... He's spending time with his family now. He's been improperly in custody for two months. One of two brothers accused of first-degree murder in the death of a Hamilton High School student has the charge withdrawn. And... Public high school teachers announce they'll hold another one-day walkout, the third this month, if a deal can't be reached with the government. Good evening, I'm Talia Ricci. It was called Project Community Space. All three levels of government pitched in to the 15-week project, totaling $4.5 million to address gun violence in priority neighborhoods, Jane and Finch being one of them where just last night a 16-year-old boy was seriously injured in a drive-by shooting. But as Ali Shiasan reports, the police are calling the project a success. And he just bust in and was, I was so scared. It was like, uh, so uh, my friend got shot, my friend got shot, and they bust the door in. Cody well, Lamb lives just up the street from where last night's drive-by took place at Jane and Firgrove. That's where a car pulled up on a group of young men as they crossed the street. Bullets sprayed out the window, hitting a 16-year-old boy multiple times. His friends carried him as he fell in and out of consciousness to the first door that opened, Cody Lamb's house. He told us just a silver car, like, they pull up and they just shot him. He got shot twice. One went through his foot and one is through the uh, team. So were you helping him? What were you doing before I, the... I was, I was like, um, pick, uh, gave him the paper tower and, and then my uncle came and I helped him like put pressure on the, the shot. Lam and his roommates turned the vestibule into a makeshift triage until first responders arrived. I think I still see some blood here. Oh yeah, that, that, that was definitely this. Lam lives in one of the city's priority neighborhoods, as defined by the police. He knows it, but hasn't ever felt it. Uh, I heard a couple like gun shooting over here around the neighborhood, but like it doesn't affect me a lot. But like I saw like in real life, like, I'm I'm pretty scared now. While officers investigate the circumstances of that shooting and to others that happened overnight, Superintendent Stephen Watts was at Toronto Police Headquarters touting the results of a 15-week police crackdown on gun violence. Our specialized approach allowed officers to make hundreds of arrests. They focused on areas known to have gang violence and were able to crack down on re-offenders. Of the 463 arrests made, 97 of these individuals were out on firearm-related bails. Superintendent Watts also acknowledged that enforcement does not address the root causes of gun violence. For that, more work needs to be done. It will be the community that will end up assisting us to solve these shootings. That is the reality. Sometimes it's the communities that become first responders. It's what I do, though. Like, I, I see someone needs help, I help them. So. Police haven't given an update on this drive-by shooting investigation. They haven't yet released any suspect or vehicle descriptions. As for Project Community Space, the city's high rate of shootings continued throughout its 15-week duration. So we haven't seen a dip in shooting occurrences, but police say they have had a higher success rate in solving recent shootings. I'm told that in the coming weeks, Police Chief Mark Saunders will announce that he would like to see at least some version of Project Community Space become permanent. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. One of two teens accused of killing a Hamilton High School student has been cleared of first-degree murder charges. In October, Devin Bracky Selvi was fatally stabbed outside his high school. The 14-year-old had been bullied for months. Ellen Morrow was at the courthouse today and has more. There was a lot of emotion as the 18-year-old left the courtroom this morning. He was embraced by his family and friends and escorted out of this courthouse in Hamilton arm in arm with his father. Now, he had been held for more than two months on a first-degree murder charge in the death of Devin Selvi, who was stabbed to death outside of his high school in October. He is no longer facing that charge. That charge has been withdrawn. He is now facing lesser charges related to events in the minutes before Devin Selvi was killed, but 
not the murder itself. Those charges include assault with a weapon and administering a noxious substance. CBC News previously reported that the 18-year-old was involved it's in an altercation uh, in the minutes before Selvi was killed, where he allegedly sprayed bear mace at a family friend of the Selvi family. Now, again, a lot of emotion as he was led out of this courthouse today, released on a lengthy set of conditions under the supervision of his mother and father, and we spoke to his lawyer uh, after his appearance. Here's what she had to say. He's spending time with his family now. He's been improperly in custody for two months, uh, shuffled between three different institutions. He has spent significant time in segregation, so right now he's just looking forward to going home with his family as he should be. Now, the 18-year-old was arrested in October alongside his 14-year-old brother. The 14-year-old remains in custody. He is still facing a charge of first-degree murder. Police allege that he uh, is the one who stabbed Devin Selvi in the back outside of his high school in broad daylight in October. Uh, so a lot of emotion for the 18-year-old's family today and emotion for the family of Devin Selvi. His mother, Sherry Ann, was outside of this courthouse this morning. She did not want to speak to us to... Uh, distraught, instead being embraced by a friend outside here as the 18-year-old was appearing inside the courtroom. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Hamilton. Parents, get ready. For the third week in a row, teachers will hold a one-day walkout. Wednesday's strike will not affect Toronto schools this time, but it will impact other boards in the GTA. Here's what you need to know. The following boards will take part in the one-day strike at high schools. Both the York Region and York Catholic boards, as well as the Halton District School Board. Secondary school teachers at the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board will also go on strike on Wednesday. But there is a chance the strike could get called off. The OSSTF and the province will hold negotiations on Monday and Tuesday of next week. If no deal is reached in these days, the strike will go forward. In a statement, the teachers' union says they're hopeful for serious bargaining over those days. As for the province, Education Minister Stephen Lecce released his own statement, calling on OSSTF to cease the job action. And get ready to pay more to ride the rocket next year. The TTC is proposing a fare increase for certain forms of payment. If you use cash or buy individual Presto tickets, those are staying at $3.25 for adults. But using your Presto card will go up by a dime to $3.20. And a monthly Presto pass will jump nearly 5 bucks to $156. Senior and youth fares will also go up by $0.10 cents regardless of how you pay. And if approved at a board meeting on Monday, these changes would take effect on March 1st. The TTC expects to generate more than $31 million. Meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now for a first look at our forecast. And I think that the constant weather conversation I was hearing today was what a beautiful day. Yeah, just so nice to have our temperatures running above seasonal, tell you, today. And they were a few, four, almost five degrees, almost five degrees above seasonal. So pretty nice. Uh, it always seems, though, when we get something nice like that, that we have to pay for it in some manner with the weather. So moving in overnight tonight, we'll see towards dawn. Uh, it may begin as a little bit of a mix, but then turning into rain. Winds increasing, becoming breezy. Yes, it'll be strong. Uh, those winds will be strong into Sunday as well, and that's going to cool. The temperatures come down, but it's going to be the winds that make it feel even colder. So we'll get into some of those numbers a little bit later. But right now, I just want to show you the system that's going to work its way in, making for a very messy Saturday. So could get a little bit of freezing drizzle, or freezing rain, first of all, as it comes in overnight. Primarily, it comes in as a rainstorm. This is into tomorrow morning. So periods of rain heavier at times, but it doesn't last that long. So say maybe 10 or 15 millimeters. Then we could get into a little bit of freezing rain and then kind of a mix with some wet flurries before it exits away from us. By Saturday evening, we'll be seeing things drying out into the GTA. Some squalls setting up, though, so possibly some flurries coming back into the city as we go towards Saturday night and into Sunday. But tonight, 2 degrees as temperatures stay relatively mild. We might drop down to one in a few areas, certainly. And then tomorrow afternoon, just going up to three and getting into that mix a little bit later in the day. You'll want to be cautious on the roadways if you're doing any traveling tomorrow because we could have that little bit of freezing rain. Talia? All right, good to know. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. 
We have a happy update to a story you may have heard earlier today. Toronto police put out a public appeal to help them track down a woman who stole a dog after its owner suffered a medical emergency at a subway station. This is Charlie. He was taken back in October at Kipling Station. His owner, a 45-year-old woman, suffered a medical episode and went unconscious. When she came to, Charlie was gone. Well, we can happily report that tonight, Charlie was turned into police. They say the Good Samaritan had updated all of Charlie's shots and even bought him a new coat. But police are still looking for the woman that took him. She's described as 5'2 to 5'5, five five, around 100 pounds, wearing black aviator sunglasses, a purple jacket and blue jeans. She was carrying two black backpacks and a black bag covered in white stars. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. The Ford government is pitching co-ownership as a way to fight the provincial housing crisis. They released a consumer guide earlier this week offering tips for how prospective buyers could go about it. To find out how this works, Taylor Simmons visited a home in Mississauga built specifically for sharing. So I'm going to take you through to unit number one. Every element of this home near Lakeshore and Clarkson is made with multiple owners in mind. There are large communal spaces, but also four sectioned off units. So everyone has a four piece bathroom, which is private. So Leslie Gaynor is the sales rep for the home. She also owns a company that provides advice to those looking to co-own. This is a really great way for people to buy property and support each other. It's an option the Ontario government is also encouraging. They released a guide earlier this week looking at innovative housing options amid a housing crisis. Cheryl Bradby helped design the Mississauga home. She also lives there. I was concerned about aging with dignity and community. And we do not provide very good housing for older women. I wanted to get into the market and there was no way for me to do it uh, otherwise. I'll take you now to the common space. But of course, the arrangement isn't easy. The very first challenge is to make sure that you're ready to live your life in a defined relationship that is defined by real estate as opposed to marriage or family. You have to be ready to borrow money as a whole group, so there's some financial nakedness. Gaynor says the government can make it easier by changing zoning laws and the Mortgages Act to help groups borrow money. On that, the Ministry of Housing would only say it's cutting red tape. Well, there's challenges in living with anybody, isn't there, you know? For anyone considering the move, Bradby's advice, first, write up a good contract, then... Get in a community and make sure you like each other and just deal with the issues. This home is listed at a cool 2.35 million, so not for everyone. But for those unable to find a space to call home, advocates say sharing is at least something to consider. Taylor Simmons, CBC News, Toronto. It is happening everywhere all along the 401, the 404, Highway 11. Canada's National Human Trafficking Hotline has only been around for six months, but in that time, it's been contacted over 1,000 times. We'll have more on that coming up.
More than 1,000 calls and messages in only six months. That's how many times people have contacted the country's first national human trafficking hotline, with our province having the highest number of calls. I spoke with a survivor who says how the hotline could have helped her. It's very lonely, right? And um, you don't know what's happening. And I didn't know what was happening to me. Caitlin Bick says her journey to recovery began after she was pulled over by police with her traffickers on the highway. So we drove. So it was my trafficker who at that time I, I identified him as my boyfriend um, and his friend. We drove to Calgary. Um, and I remember we got arrested uh, in Marathon, Ontario. Um, the bottom line is it is happening everywhere, all along the 401, the 404, Highway 11, any major route, any city, any town, there's someone um, that's being trafficked in your backyard for sure. And on highways like this one, you could be driving alongside victims of sex trafficking who are being transported from city to city. These highways act as corridors, moving victims around so that the traffickers aren't detected by police. And that's why a hotline that could be reached from anywhere, anytime was needed. And after just six months, the hotline has already been contacted more than 1,000 times. And many victims and survivors who are being transported from city to city don't have their family around them, don't have people they can trust around them. So in many cases as well, they're also um, victims of extreme forms of violence or threats. So they may be isolated. They may be unsure of who to call. The new hotline is a tool to help victims, but also anyone who wants to report a tip. It's completely confidential, and the center hopes eventually data they collect will help develop solutions. We think it's important to collect the data so we can actually determine in generalities what types of human trafficking are happening across the country, what are the indicators of human trafficking um, specifically, where the incidence of human trafficking is happening across the country, and how we can provide information to law enforcement in the future and hopefully dismantle trafficking networks right across the country. I know for myself, my traffickers made it very clear that what I was doing was illegal and I will go to jail. So the police were not really on my radar. <laughs> Caitlin says if there was a hotline when she was being trafficked, maybe it would have helped her. Wow, if that was around when I was being trafficked and I was all alone in my hotel room and I was able to hear about it or find out about it or have someone tell me, um, it would have made a difference. Toronto Police's human trafficking enforcement team says the tips coming in from the hotline are making a difference. They've helped speed up some investigations. The hotline can help bring tips to police without putting the victims at risk. Coming up, he's responsible for shining a light on racism in the NHL. And now, Akeem Alou is bringing an important message to some future hockey stars. We'll have that story in just a few minutes.
The weather update is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Colette's back now with our extended forecast, and you teased us with a not-so-good-looking weekend, but hopefully <laughs> it gets a little better later on. Yeah, we are looking at, in terms of our sky conditions or what's happening, some active weather coming in, tell you for sure, into Saturday. We were treated to some nice conditions today. Our high over 5 degrees, average high is closer to 1, just over, so significantly warmer. Uh, our low was even a little bit on the mild side, too, but this is the situation. So this is a bunch of moisture that's moving up system that's been coming up the eastern seaboard. So it's from the southeastern U.S. We have some of that cloud cover in place. Overnight tonight, there could be a bit of a mix or a little bit of iciness to it, although it'll be light in nature, some patchy fog concerns as well, so some reduced visibility. Again, mostly through the overnight, because then it turns into rain as we go towards the morning hours. We'll see at times a little bit heavier in terms of its intensity, but it doesn't hang around too long. The system moves through pretty quickly. We're going to take you towards the lunch hour and then just beyond. We get into a mix, may see some freezing rain into the GTA and then some wet flurries on the backside. The winds pick up, it begins to exit, and so by the time we get towards the evening, we should be drying out. However, with some stronger winds on Saturday night and into Sunday, some snow squalls setting up, so again, some flurries make their way down into the GTA. But otherwise, I'd actually expect that Sunday we will see some sunshine. So it's not a bad day. It's just going to be quite blustery. And so the temperatures do come down from where they are today and where they'll be Saturday, but it'll feel like we're at about minus 5 to minus 10 in terms of a wind chill. Yes, snowfall, the potential is there for a centimeter or two with some of this wet, slushy stuff that won't stick around there. Now, further towards the north into cottage country, this is going a little bit high, but this is taking you all the way into Sunday with some of the setup with the snow squalls. So that's why we're seeing some of those amounts getting a bit higher up there. Risk of freezing drizzle into southwestern Ontario, your temperature just above zero through the overnight. For tomorrow, some freezing drizzle. Again, your intensity should be much lighter as the system is more to the east. There we go with our overnight temperatures, anywhere from 2 to 0 at Markham, that 2 for St. Catharines region, and those winds picking up tomorrow. They'll get even stronger into Sunday, by the way. So the temperatures, yeah, 2 to 3 degrees tomorrow afternoon, and that Sunday changeover is to 0, but feeling, like I said, even in the afternoon with the winds, it's going to feel like about minus 7 or so. Monday night into Tuesday, I do want to mention we may pick up Another bit of snow coming through, could be three, five centimeters or so. That's something we're watching out for next week. All right, Colette, I think I'm going to remain positive and say at least we got a bit of sunshine coming. <laughs> yeah, a bit of sunshine on Sunday, right? It'll be a pretty day. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome.
In the last few weeks, Akeem Alou sent a lightning rod through the hockey community, speaking out about racism he experienced. Today, he spoke to youth hoping to skate their way into the future. His message was one of hope. Greg Ross joined them on the ice. He was only on the ice with them for about an hour, but the bond Akeem Aliou says he felt with this group of kids was instant. I know what it's like to be in their shoes, um, and obviously this hits super close to home. I didn't grow up with much. And like these kids, Aliou immigrated to Canada at a young age. They're part of a group called Hockey for Youth that introduces the game to kids who are newcomers to Canada and live in impoverished neighborhoods. It makes me dream of being like him one day. I felt like he was my big brother, you know, coming here and uh, tra training me too. All I want to do is kind of raise awareness to, to minorities, which I think is um, lacking a little bit. And like these kids, Aliou immigrated to Canada at a young age. They're part of a group called Hockey for Youth that introduces the game yeah. to kids who are newcomers to Canada and live in impoverished neighbourhoods. The message that I'm trying to send here is in the fact that we need to be more inclusive. We need to bring more minorities into our game and I just think it's going to make our game that much better. Last month, Aliou spoke out about racism he experienced as a player in the Chicago Blackhawks organization. He accused his former coach, Bill Peters, of using racial slurs. It cost Peters his current job with the Calgary Flames. It also emboldened other players to speak up about inappropriate behavior they had experienced at the hands of coaches. The coach is the power in the room, so there's always going to be some sort of that, but hopefully we can um, wind that down to a smaller scale and um, see more respect going both ways. Yeah. It also led to a meeting exactly. between Aliou and NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman. He hopes to continue working closely with the NHL to make the game more inclusive and safer for players. The goal right now is to be as collaborative as we can with the league. Where that's going to go, I, I, I'm not sure. But we're just trying to bounce ideas off each other of how we can make things um, make things better. And while Aliou wants to continue working with kids to help them chase their dreams, he still hasn't given up on his own. He says he's in the best shape of his life, and at 30 years old, Aliou believes he still has a few more years left to try and get back into the NHL. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. And that's our show for you tonight. Thanks for watching. Maribel Tarouk has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. And we leave you with pictures of people out and about at Nathan Phillips Square tonight for the annual holiday Fair in the Square. People having a skate and enjoying the mild weather on this Friday night. Good night.